pandemic postponed many life events, but one family persevered in its effort to mark a milestone. I made it, I made it. <laughs> We'd like new people to come down and introduce them to any one of the three sports. Want to get rolling with fun activities that'll also keep you fit? We know just the place. Oh, man. Jake, look. And there's just hillsides full of stairways. Step right up. This phrase fits Seattle, a city of stairways. And one couple knows this better than most. Come over here. Here's one. These stories and more next on City Stream. Hello, I'm Linda Byron. Welcome to City Stream from the Mountaineers here at Magnuson Park. For more than a century, this organization has been teaching people the skills necessary to explore the outdoors safely and responsibly. It does this by hosting hundreds of monthly courses and activities, all led by volunteers. And it's clear there's plenty of interest. The Mountaineers have 15,000 active members across the Northwest. And while that organization helps connect people to the outdoors, the pandemic prevented us from being together for major milestones with our family and our friends. And that separation taught us just how much those celebrations mean. This next story reveals one family's resilience. And while they couldn't completely recapture what they'd lost, they found grace in trying. Nicole Stankovich started learning piano when she was just six. By 16, she was winning international competitions and performing in Carnegie Hall. A self-described introvert, it was piano that set her free. When I play, it really just expresses how I feel moment. Sometimes I don't even know how I'm feeling until I am um, perform. Nicole was thrilled when legendary pianist Dr. Robin McCabe accepted her into the University of Washington's music program. By late 2019, Nicole was preparing for the most consequential performance of her life, her senior recital. This is the bulletin board that students hang up posters just advertising their upcoming recitals. Around March of 2020, I started seeing them get canceled, and so I kind of had a feeling that mine would be canceled too, and it was. Then, the in-person graduation at Husky Stadium was scrapped. It's bittersweet. Pomp and Circumstances, uh, one of those pieces where when you hear it, you're kind of saying goodbye to something, but also saying hello to the future. But that future had just become a big question mark. So Nicole flew home to Park City, Utah, where she'd grown up. She performed that senior recital in her parents' living room. The family took photos, watched UW's virtual commencement, and tuned in for the piano department's grand finale which just didn't feel so grand on a computer screen. I think it was better than nothing, um, but still a little disappointing. Good. Once back in Seattle, craving so connection, working. Nicole began teaching piano full time. You get that sticker. And through hours of reflection, Nicole discovered the pandemic didn't so much stop her in her tracks, it sent her in a new direction. I'm going to do a master's in piano performance, as well as a master's in public health. A million people died in just our country alone, and it really showed the weaknesses of our, our system. But first, Nicole and her friend Jessica have something important to do. What kind of dress do you want to get? I don't know. The UW is holding a special commencement ceremony for the classes of 2020 and 2021. I don't want to miss out on this, um, and I want to give my parents the appreciation that they deserve and the moment that they deserve. After two years, I realized how much I wanted them here. As immigrants, her parents need this moment just as much as Nicole, who's now the first in the family to earn a college degree. But COVID 
isn't finished wreaking havoc. Hi, you on the way to the airport? Oh, you're wearing purple. That's our school color. Nicole's mother owns a busy Chinese restaurant in Park City that's short staffed. So the family booked an evening flight the night before the graduation. They uh, got to the airport last night and their flight got canceled. Were there any tears? There, there, there were for me. <laughs> My mom was more <laughs> just angry. The best they can do is stand by for a 5.30 a.m. flight, which will still get them to Seattle in plenty of time. But that plane is overbooked. I immediately got on the phone to try and see if, you know, we could get him another flight. Okay, today we make it. Hey, so exciting. We're going to see Coco. <laughs> see you guys soon over there. Are you all class of 2021? 2020 is this site. Hi. I'm Jessica's mom right now. It's yeah. 4 a.m. in Taiwan. As the returning graduates start to enter the stadium, Nicole finally has good news. They're on a plane. It's a two-hour flight. If they arrive early and commencement starts late, they could still make it. Now entering the stadium are the bachelors. Nicole is missing her family, feeling far more emotional than she anticipated. 2020 this feels light years away from today, and um, I realized that, you know, I actually cared a lot more than I thought. Hello, graduates of the classes 2020 and 2021. It's so good to finally be here at Husky Stadium. Graduation ceremonies are notorious for moving slowly. If time is on Nicole's side, this one will go really, really slowly. There are a few lessons one learns as a dean. One is not to be long-winded. As master's students begin walking up to accept diplomas, Nicole's family is entering Oregon, 52 minutes to arrival. Now, the turning of the tassel. On the count of three, one, two, three. Nicole is keeping tabs on her phone. As bachelor students start to walk, only 14 minutes left in the flight. But in a cruel twist of fate, as Nicole finally takes her iconic walk, her parents are over the stadium, not in it. They tried their best for sure, um, and you know I'm just I'm glad that they still decided to come. After two years of waiting, all Nicole needed was another 40 minutes, but time was never on her side. Where are you guys? Oh no, I think I see them. That's that's them. Uh, it's yeah. been an unforgettable day with twists and turns and bitter disappointments. Jessica. But Nicole and her family find joy <laughs> in the simplest way. <laughs> <laughs> by being together. Hold on. It's me. Hey. Hey. Uh, I, it no longer matters they miss the entire ceremony. <laughs> Life is about stories. I made it. I made it. <laughs> this one will be told for years to come. I, I, I told her over the phone, I said, like, look, we try, we try, we try. We, we will be there one way or another. Even this morning, we had no chance to get on the airplane. I said, we got to go. It definitely gives me a sense of closure. Oh, I'm so happy right now. Yeah, this is all I really wanted. Nicole's Taiwan family couldn't get to Seattle for the makeup graduation because of spiking COVID numbers in that country. But they are determined to make the next commencement ceremony. Nicole is starting grad school at the UW in the fall. Just ahead, come here to be active, have fun, and enjoy the third most popular sport in the world. We'll explain as CityStream continues.
If you're searching for activities that are low impact, easy to learn, and guaranteed to make you smile, we have three suggestions, and all happen at the same Seattle park. Curious? Producers Kathy Tui and Valerie Vaza explain. Tucked away in the northwest corner of Woodland Park, just off Aurora, is an overlooked gem of a park. It's a place where you can learn the ins and outs of croquet, have a go at lawn bowling, or try your hand at bocce. Don't be short, Mario. It's the Woodland Park Lawn Bowling Bocce and Croquet Club. Oh. <laughs> and it all started back in 1940 with the opening of a lawn bowling club. The club flourished for decades, but then popularity waned. About 20 years ago, lawn bowling just started falling off a little bit, and they were having trouble with membership numbers and Meanwhile, Croquet was interested in, in expanding and Bocce was looking for a home in the city. Good job. And so now we're doing pretty good. We've got probably around 130 total members. A lot of those are Bocce players. And then we have a, a smaller cadre of Croquet and lawn bowlers. We have a lease agreement with the city and we provide public access hours. We provide the facility for rentals and other activities. Throughout the summer, there are evening open houses in all three sports. Newcomers are invited to come out, take a lesson, and learn a new game. Tonight, it's croquet. When most people think of croquet, they think of the casual backyard game. But the competitive version of croquet is much different. It's played on smooth greens with one stake in the center and six narrow wickets, making it a game of both precision and strategy. You could do what we call promoting a ball. What you're doing is putting the ball you hit in a better position. Excellent, that's exactly it. People who are interested in continuing can become members, play more often, and improve their technique. If you're intimidated by the size of that wicket, you might want to try rolling a ball instead of striking it. In lawn bowling, the balls are called bowls. And just to make it interesting, they're not completely round. And they're a bias bowl, which means that they're shaped a little bit different on each side. So the bowl can curl and break as it hunts down the target ball, called the jack. Uh -oh. Each person has four bowls, um, and you do, deliver them alternately. You keep alternating until all four bowls for each person are delivered. And then you go down and you figure out who's the closest one to the jack ball, and then they get the first point. Look, 60 and a half. I really like the pace of play. It's not like a super strenuous game, but it's also very strategic. It's all about your consistency. The third lawn sport at the club, bocce, is one of the oldest in the world and said to be the third most popular sport worldwide after soccer and golf. We're at Lower Woodland Bocce Club, league night on Mondays. We play uh, June, July, and August as our league nights. Bocce and lawn bowling have a few things in common, one being that they both have a little ball that all the big balls want to be around. In bocce, it's called the polino. I throw the polino out. I throw my ball out, and then the competition or my competitor throws their ball out until they get closer than mine to the polino. If they do that, then it's my turn. Balls are thrown underhand, but in a variety of ways. You can gently lag it. You can bank it. Or you could do whatever this is. Oh, stop, stop, stop. After each round, the team with the bocce ball closest to the Polino receives points. What's so appealing about this ancient sport? Anybody can play. Um, our mom played till she was about 85, and so literally anybody can play. Couldn't be more fun. I got my 12-year-old son comes out and plays with us as well. We come every week and we meet, met great people who are really helpful and teaching us and getting us like excited about the game. Yeah, it's, it's a great time. We really love it. We won. We're winners. All the way. With 
such a buffet of great games available at the club, where should you begin? Croquet is definitely the best game. Lawn bowling, I think, is uh, the more challenging, I think. But bocce is damn good. I just love a ball rolling on green grass in the sun. There's still time to check out the open houses and free lessons. Tuesdays are croquet, Wednesdays are lawn bowling, and Fridays are all bocce. So if you're interested, head to the website for the Woodland Park Lawn Bowling Club and get the ball rolling. The website is WPLBC.org. We're fortunate in Seattle to have so many locations to walk along the shoreline. Not only is it great exercise, it also offers a chance to explore fascinating marine life. One example, moon snails. Urban naturalist and author Kelly Brenner shares tips on how to track down these shelled gastropods. We're here at Constellation Beach in West Seattle looking for moon snails. These snails like a nice sandy beach because they dig down under the sand to look for their favorite food, which is clams. So a moon snail itself is actually quite hard to find, but there are lots of signs of moon snails that you can find around on the beaches. And so here's one clam shell that has been preyed on by a moon snail. The moon snail drills down into the clam shell and it basically sucks out the clam um, over a number of hours. And here's a good pile of the egg collars that the moon snails make. As they sit, they start to disintegrate, and that's what they're supposed to do. And as it disintegrates, the eggs are released out into the water, and hopefully to create new little moon snails. They try to go down when the water goes out, so we'll be, have better luck finding them down, or down lower. Here's one. So I think what we have here is a moon snail actually laying eggs. So most of it's under, under the sand, but this little bit, it's attached. That is so cool. It was moving, you can see it moving. So this, we've very incredibly found a moon snail actually laying eggs. This is the moon snail's body, this is its foot. And it's like I'm a silky texture. So apparently, I, I've never seen them actually lay eggs. Apparently when they are laying eggs, they kind of flip up because we obviously saw the foot and then when it was done, it started to rotate and the shell was back on the top again. And now that it's all done, it's starting, it righted itself and now it's starting to dig back down into the sand again. In Seattle, we, we're just ridiculously lucky because we have so many different habitats from forests to wetlands to the beach. And we can have a sighting of an orca one day, we can have octopus, we can have nudibranchs. There's just so much to discover and, and it's just so much fun. <laughs> From moon snails to moving up, Seattle is a city of stairways. We'll show you how and where to get your steps in as City Stream continues.
If you've ever walked this city, you've probably noticed Seattle has a lot of stairways. Some scale steep hills, others link city streets, and all provide instant access to exercise and exploration. We decided to tour the city stairways with some folks so passionate about them, they wrote a guidebook. Producers Lowell Deo and Vincent Pierce take a look. Seattle is a city of hills. It is a complex topography built by both man and nature. At one point, there was said to have been 3,000 feet of ice above Seattle. So it really sculpted a lot of the landscape and created a lot of hills. And to battle those hills, Seattle has built stairs, a lot of them. OK, how many stairways? I'm going to guess 286. There are roughly 650 publicly available stairways in Seattle. Oh, well, I guess I was off a bit. I guess there's some neighborhoods I haven't tried. Those 650 stairways became a bit of an obsession for Jake and Kathy Jaramillo. Well, our friends don't come and visit us anymore because we take them on too many stairway walks. It's an obsession that began over 20 years ago. Great view over here. We just kind of took off around the neighborhood, and here's this stairway, and it goes up the side of a hill and disappears into foliage, and we're going, where does this stairway lead to? That first stairway led to another, and another, and another. And I'm looking out the window, and I go, Jake, look! And there's just hillsides full of stairways, and I think that's what sparked us. That spark ignited an idea. Oh, and look, there's somebody with our book. Oh, yeah, they got our book. Come over here. <laughs> you're meeting the authors of that book. <laughs> <laughs> did you know, did you know if you're going for a walk on level? It turns out Jake and Kathy weren't the only ones obsessed with Seattle stairways, but nobody had written a guidebook. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> the stairways slow you down and take you to sites that you wouldn't otherwise see. But for some, it's not about slowing down, but speeding up. Well, I'm just trying to, you know, get my fitness back. I uh, got a new knee back you know, early May. Just an old, old fogey out here, you know, trying not to give up. But when you're staring up at the 388 steps of Seattle's longest stairway, not giving up is easier said than done. It's very steep. Uh, this is the first portion of the stairs. Uh, the lower half is actually, I think, twice the length of this one that you're looking at. This is a brutal set of stairs here, and you know people get a little too, you know, expect too much of themselves, and this is a very humbling set of stairs here. It's a good day to be outside and out of the gym. On any dry day in Seattle, the stairs of the city transform from mere route to bona fide destination. Seattle stairways aren't just about kicking up your cardio, however. Uh, sir, for some of us who are more like the senior citizen crowd, I just take my time. And taking your time has its own rewards. I think, I think the funnest thing is the exploration, wandering around for a day, looking at different stairways and different nooks and crannies of the neighborhood. Every stairway is different. Every neighborhood is different. What well, exactly gets you out into parts of the neighborhood you wouldn't have seen otherwise? The stairways are like scenic byways. Byways that lead you into tunnels made of trees, through green spaces and urban oases, and around corners that contain discoveries at every bend. Now, this is a way to actually explore with your own body um, the topography of Seattle and get the views and also see the neighborhoods and all the quirky things that you'll see by doing it on foot. So don't let gravity get you down. There's a set of stairs out there for everyone. These stairs don't limit you. You, can, you only limit yourself. You can start from the very top and go halfway or a quarter way. And when you reach the top or the bottom, don't forget that while Seattle built the stairways, the stairways in turn built Seattle. You see history. You see different kinds of architecture. 
they're really important to what we are. I like to see more people be aware of, of our legacy of stairways in Seattle um, because only if you use them and value them will you, will you preserve them. Let's go take a walk on the stairs. Come on. <laughs> If you're ready to step up, you can find resources on how and where to explore Seattle's outdoor staircases at seattlestairwaywalks.com. We'll be right back. And that wraps up this episode of City Stream from Magnuson Park. I'm Linda Byron. Thank you for watching.